There's an old man called a Mississippi. That's the old man that I'd like to be. What does he care if the world's got troubles? What does he care if the land ain't free? Old Man River, that old man river, he must know something, but don't say nothing. He just keeps rolling, he keeps on rolling along. Today's program is entitled For the Love of the River, Exploring Mark Twain's Life on the Mississippi. Confession time. I had never read Life on the Mississippi in its entirety before I was doing my preparations for this review. The reason I selected it is because we wanted to think about the Mississippi River and the important history behind it. And this book seems to be the right book because it also happened to be by one of my favorite American authors, Mark Twain. I do appreciate Amanda Taylor, who's the director of the Concordia Parish Public Library and her great team for putting this together for us. And of course, I deeply appreciate the sponsorship of the program by Delta Bank. I hope you'll enjoy it. We're gonna take a little travel around the Mississippi River and, and through it, we're also gonna learn some things I think you may not know about Mark Twain. Few people really know his true full name, Samuel Langhorn Clemens. They just know him as Mark Twain. And few people know, unless they studied him in American literature, um, few people realize the multiple careers that this man had. Um, he was very successful in some and he was a total failure in others, but in everything, he was always one of the most interesting writers that America has ever produced. When you hear the name Mark Twain, what do you think of first? A lot of people will immediately say, oh, Huckleberry Finn, and others might say Tom Sawyer, a few might laugh and start talking about that amazing jumping frog in Calaveras County. And some might know that it was Twain who published President Grant's memoirs. Most though, I think if they think long enough, would think of the Mississippi River when they think of Mark Twain. It was the river that gave Clemens his unique name, Mark Twain. It was the river that always held a very special place in Twain's heart. And the four years that he spent apprenticing for two, learning to be a pilot, a steamboat pilot, and the two years after he had his certificate and he actually operated steamboats as a pilot. That four year period, he often said, was the happiest time of his whole life. Throughout his life, and he had some tough times, he never forgot his river, and he often went back to her in memories of her that uh, sustained him through those rough times. This is a, a map of the watershed of the Mississippi River, and when you take a look at it, it's pretty breathtaking. Um, this river is an amazing river. It's the third largest river basin in the world. It's just smaller than the Amazon and the Congo. And when you consider the Missouri River as its primary branch, which Twain always did, then it is the longest river in the world. That watershed that you're looking at covers 40% of the continental United States a drop of water that starts in the headwaters and travels through the river to the mouth at the Gulf of Mexico will take a full three months to make that journey. It discharges three times as much water as the St. Lawrence, 25 times as much water as the Rhine, 
and 338 times the amount of water discharged by the River Thames. And to a young boy, to Twain as a young boy, and so many of his contemporaries, the river represented the gateway to the world. They would put together rafts and get on those rafts and travel on the river a bit and pretend that they were great steamboat pilots, that they were going to some of the romantic places in the world. It was a time of great imagination and for young boys, it was a very important time in their growing up. The things that make Mark Twain famous, that made him famous during his own lifetime and which make him famous even today, are first, his memorable characters. If you thought of Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer, you've thought of two of them right there. He had an extremely sharp wit, sometimes a very cutting wit, almost always, unless you were the victim, a very funny wit. He had a brilliant ability to capture the essence of language. And connected to that was a very delicious sense of timing. Now, mind you, timing with the spoken word is easier to convey than timing in a printed word. He was able to write his dialogues, his conversations in such a way that the timing for comedic effect was there for the reader to see. One of the questions that often comes up about Twain is, okay, well, so he's lasted this long. Will he really, you know, will anybody be all that interested in him in another hundred years or so? I think the answer is yes. And I think one of the people who showed us the enduring quality of Mark Twain was Hal Holbrook. Hal Holbrook, the late actor, uh, was quite an amazing fellow. Jim and I had the opportunity to meet him. We had the opportunity to serve him dinner after one of his performances of Mark Twain Tonight, which I cooked and which we all enjoyed. Of course, we sat down to dinner at midnight because he doesn't eat a thing didn't then eat a thing before he did his performance, but after he was ravenous. Holbrook played Mark Twain for more than 60 years. He began playing Twain at the age of 29, and he retired the role in 2017 when he was 92. He had performed his Mark Twain Tonight program over 2,000 times. Uh, a lot of people remember that he was happily married to Dixie Carter. She was uh, quite the actress herself. July 14, 2008, Time Magazine did a Making of America issue. It's an annual thing that they do. And they dedicated it to Samuel Clemens. It's called the front uh, cover, as you see here. The title is The Dangerous Mind of Mark Twain, how he changed the way we view politics, why he was ahead of his time on matters of race, what his writing teaches us about America today. I would argue it still does in 2022 teach us things, and I think it will for many, many decades to come. Time, when it was introducing that article, published this. Today's political humorists owe a nod to Twain. Not quite a century after his death in 1910, we get a lot of our news from people like him, the funny men and funny women who talk about things that are not otherwise funny at all. 2008 is an election year in which some of the most closely followed commentators are comedians like Jon Stewart, Bill Meyer, Stephen Colbert, and the cast of Saturday Night Live. All of them are descended from that man in the white suit. I would argue that that was true in 2008, and it's certainly true in 2022, and it will continue to be true as long as there are politicians and comedians. But let's look at the book. Let's look at Life on the Mississippi. I said to you that I had not read it in its entirety before. I had seen excerpts of it in my classwork, but had never sat down to read the whole thing. 
I was not disappointed, and I don't believe you will either. It was published in 1883. One of the problems with the book is it's hard to classify. It is incorrectly classified as a novel. It is not a novel. But it's also something unique. It's two things in one. In one, a portion of it is a memoir of his days on the Mississippi River when he learned to be the steamboat pilot that he became. And that was the period before the Civil War. The other portion of the book is actually a travel book. And it, it concerns, in the main, a second trip that he made down the Mississippi some 21 years after the Civil War. Uh, when he goes, now he's an established writer, and he's going down the Mississippi as a passenger, but remembering the river when it was his to control with his own steamboat. The publication of Life on the Mississippi falls between the two books for which Twain is most famous. 1876, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. 1883, Life on the Mississippi. 1885, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. That's the order that they're published in, but I would argue that's not the order that they should be read in. I think they should be read as a whole book, one piece, three as one. I think they form a trilogy with the Mississippi River functioning as the connecting character among the three. The order of the publication for the trilogy is not the actual order that Train wrote the trilogy. We know that he had already written Huck Finn because he includes a portion of Huckleberry Finn in Life on the Mississippi. It's chapter three, Frescoes from the Past. The trilogy should be read in the order of Sawyer, then Finn, then Life on the Mississippi, and then the whole piece is visible. All three books feature young boys as the characters. In Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, obviously they're young kids. By the way, don't be fooled by those who insist that these two books are juvenile literature. They are anything but. They're quite adult books. They just happen to have their themes sp spoken through the mouths of children, of young people. In the case of Life on the Mississippi, the young boy character is Twain's memory of his own boyhood and growing up on the Mississippi. All three share common themes, change, progress, observation, and the importance of travel. Let's look at those themes for a minute. Change is inevitable is the first one. The river becomes a microcosm for the changing times in America through Twain's lifetime. He sees the changes that the river itself makes as it changes course and absorbs land from one side and dumps it on another side. He knows this because he sees the river as the steamboat pilot who must understand those changes in order to keep his boat and his passengers and his cargo safe. He notices the changes in which the goods and people are being moved from place to place and he sees the poor attempts at controlling the river on the part of the, uh, the men who think they can. The second theme is progress is inevitable. He recognizes that man's innate desire to build and create is always present. And so as technology develops, progress develops. Another theme is the power of keen observation, the importance of it. Twain is gifted with an amazingly acute power of observation. That's the reason he can capture the language and the mannerisms of the different characters he creates. And he notices even the most subtle changes in the surface of the river as he's traveling on the river, first as the pilot and then as the passenger 20 years later. He sees those changes and he, he sees that they tell, if you know how to read them, 
whether the trip will be one of impending peril or will be safe passage. The fourth, and I think the most underrated theme of life on the Mississippi, is the educational value of travel. Mark Twain was a very well-traveled man himself, and he understood that every new place one sees and every new person one meets teaches the traveler something of value. He was not a well-educated man. He had to leave uh, school very early. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But he always referred to his time on the Mississippi River as a university education. In one of his books, The Innocents Abroad, Twain writes this, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, and many of our people need it sorely on those accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. Let's take a closer look to the book, Life on the Mississippi. First, let's look at the Atlantic Monthly, the September 1883 edition. The Atlantic Monthly was founded in Boston in 1857 and it contained very important essays, many by famous people of the day. It is still in publication now as a 10 issue a year piece and it's called The Atlantic. In September 1883, shortly after Life on the Mississippi was published, the Atlantic Monthly have published a lengthy review of this newest of Twain's books. The Monthly had already printed 12 chapters from the book in installments. This is how the magazines worked and made their money uh, during that day, and it's the way the authors made money as well. So 12 chapters from Life on the Mississippi had been printed, and then the complete book is published for now an eager reading public to buy. The review helped readers to understand how Twain crafted the book itself. And this is important, I think, for us to understand because the book truly is in segments. In that September 1883 review, the writers at the Atlantic Monthly said this, of the first 15 chapters of Mr. Clemens' book, 12 are repented, reprinted from the Atlantic but they are so full of entertaining and instructive matter that they will repay a second reading. In the three introductory ones, which come before these, the physical character of the river is sketched, and brief reference is made to the early travelers and explorers of the stream, De Soto, Marquette, and La Salle. These belonging to the epoch of what Mr. Clemens quaintly calls historical history, as distinguished from that other unconventional history, which he does not define, but certainly embodies in the most graphic form. The Mississippi River never, never got out of Twain's system. As long as he lived, he would return periodically, at least in his thoughts, to his beloved river. That river was home to Twain and he never lost his love for it, even in the darkest periods of his day. I think that Life on the Mississippi should be read as Mark Twain's love letter to the Mississippi, because that's what it is. In the beginning of the book, he cleverly details how others had failed to see his beloved river's mystery and charm and considerable commercial value. He writes in Life on the Mississippi, Apparently, nobody happened to want such a river. Nobody needed it. Nobody was curious about it. So for a century and a half, the Mississippi remained out of the market and undisturbed. When DeSoto found it, he was not hunting for a river and had no present occasion for one. Consequently, he did not value it or even take any particular notice of it. <laughs> This is a painting by William Henry Powell. It's a, a lovely piece. It was painted by Powell uh, and it has 
at the request of Congress, and it hangs in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda today. It's probably the most recognized depiction of Spanish conquistador and explorer Hernando de Soto's discovering the river and claiming it for Spain. He made that discovery on May 8th, 1541, and he's the first European documented to have ever seen the river. But for Twain and for others, the new technology of the steamboat was the epitome of the romance of the Mississippi. These boats were massive for their day and could transport both passengers and cargo in quantities, and in the case of passengers, luxuries not seen before. The steamboat pilot was the hero. He commanded his steamboat from the tiny little pilot house right at the top of the boat. And he was highly respected among men and the subject of deepest envy among young boys. The steamboat era in the United States lasted roughly from 1811 to around 1920. Flatboats and keel boats had been the primary means of navigating the river before 1811, when the steamboat appeared. It was in the form of the New Orleans. It was the first steamboat on the Mississippi River. The steamboats reached their peak after the Civil War. Railroads gradually replaced steamboats as the major transportation means. Obviously, the steamboat is restricted to the river's path. Railroads could be built in any direction and over any terrain. And after 1920, only a few steamboats and those for tourists primarily remain. Twain, also in Life on the Mississippi, writes this. When I was a boy, there was but one permanent ambition among my comrades in our village on the west bank of the Mississippi River. That was to be a steamboatman. We had transient ambitions of other sorts, but they were only transient. When a circus came and went, it left us all burning to become clowns. The first Negro minstrel show that came to our section left us, left us all suffering to try that kind of life. Now and then, we had a hope that if we lived and were very good, God would permit us to be pirates. These ambitions faded out, each in its turn, but the ambition to be a steamboatman always remained. He wrote, your true pilot cares nothing about anything on earth but the river, and his pride in his occupation surpasses the pride of kings. Chapters 5 through 20 on Life of the Mississippi have been called by some scholars the finest writing that Twain ever did. These are the chapters that specifically detail his on-the-job training as an apprentice to become a steamboatman under the guidance of a crusty, old, seasoned steamboatman, a Mr. Bixby. These chapters are funny, these chapters are often poignant, and these chapters are always instructive because he is capturing for us here in the future exactly how the steamboat business was operated. Emphasis is also placed on those chapters on the importance of knowing the river's propensity for change. Twain saw the river's changes as being emblems of the way a person's life changes unexpected overnight. The Mississippi River, like all rivers, frankly, is always seeking the straightest and shortest distance from its headwaters to its mouth. And in this instance, it's coming from the north to the south to the Gulf of Mexico. A cutoff channel seals a bend in the river and that forms an oxbow lake. It's a piece of the river that's really not the river anymore. It's a separated lake. Steamboatmen had to be on the lookout for places where the river had changed its course since the last time they had passed that section. 
Those course changes could impact where a person's taxes were uh, paid, for example. In Life on the Mississippi, Twain describes that thusly. We dashed along without anxiety, for the hidden rock, which used to lie right in the way, has moved upstream a long distance out of the channel. Or rather, about one county has gone into the river from the Missouri point, and the Cairo point has made down and added to its long tongue of territory correspondingly. The Mississippi is a just and equitable river. It never tumbles one man's farm overboard without building another farm just like it for that man's neighbor. That keeps down hard feelings. And in discussing the concept of the cutoff in life on the Mississippi, Twain says, a cutoff plays havoc with boundary lines and jurisdictions. For instance, a man living in the state of Mississippi today, a cutoff occurs tonight and tomorrow the man finds himself and his land over on the other side of the river within the boundaries and subject to the laws of the state of Louisiana. Such a thing happening in the upper river in the old days could have transferred a slave from Missouri to Illinois and made a free man of him. Twain's discussion of the movements of the river, the changes in the river, are first the product of his acute powers of observation, second, a product of his education from Bixby, because after all, the success or failure of a steamboat mission will be determined by whether or not it is piloted correctly as to uh, where the changes in that river have occurred. Those of us who live near the Mississippi River, particularly down here in the lower half, we've seen our share of oxbow lakes and cutoffs. Let's return now to the 1883 Atlantic Monthly Review to hear what they have to say about the next portion of life on the Mississippi. This is a quote from that September 1883 review in the Atlantic Monthly. It says, then, this means after that section, those chapters through chapter 20, then comes a short autobiographic summary of Mr. Clemens' life after he had ceased to be a pilot and several other things and until he became a New Englander. I've shown here the way Twain's life divides, and particularly the way it divides in terms of how he develops life on the Mississippi. The first portion concerns his early years. He had a childhood of, of deep poverty. He worked for a period of years as an apprentice printer, and then he apprenticed and became a steamboat pilot. Then after he achieves his, his dream of becoming a steamboatman, his life falls into other patterns. He's a soldier in the Civil War, and then he deserts. He's a Western frontiersman, a newspaper reporter. He gets a column, so he becomes a newspaper columnist. He tries his hand at silver mining. He becomes a travel writer, and he becomes a lecturer and humorist. Twain's childhood, his apprenticeships, and his steamboatman career all work together to create the adult Mark Twain that we're familiar with as the author. This is a picture of his birthplace. He was born in Florida, Missouri. Florida, Missouri in 1835 uh, had two streets, uh, a couple of log houses, some sawmills and a church, and the population was less than 100. Twain boasted about his birth there. He said that when he was born, he increased the population by a full percentage point. Quote, it is more than many of the best men in history could have done for a town. It may not be modest for me to refer to this, but it is true. These are his parents, John Marshall Clemens and Jane Lambton Clemens, quite austere. 
The family moved to Hannibal, Missouri when Twain was four years old. This was a boom town. It was located on the bluffs above the Mississippi River. It was very, very, very prosperous and it had a promising future for growth. Twain's father moved his family to Hannibal because he had had a terrible business failure in Florida. He was a well thought of man and so when he was in Hannibal he was elected justice of the peace and he was also elected clerk of the surrogate court. He tried his hand at business again, he invested in a hotel and general store scheme and he failed at both of them and he left his family destitute. Twain's mother took in cooking and laundry for another family. They sold almost all of their furniture. They sent their oldest son, Orion, to St. Louis to be a printer's apprentice. The eldest daughter was old enough, she earned a little money for the family to give piano lessons. This kind of poverty was what imprinted on Twain what was to become one of his real issues as an adult. There were seven children in the family of all. This is a rendering, a map of Hannibal, Missouri in about 1869. And if you look at it closely, you'll see the river portion of it, you can count a number of steamships moving through. And you can see the bluffs in the upper left-hand corner of the, of the work. This is where he grew in his formative years. There he sat, poor, but watching the river, watching the steamboats pass, seeing other people's people have prosperity and for him to have none. Some dates are critical for Twain. 1847, his father at age 49 develops pneumonia and dies. Clemens is 11. 1848, his mother, the next year, takes him out of school and sends him off to be an apprentice at the paper again, just like Orion. He's going to the Missouri Courier. It's interesting to look on this part of his life when his education is cut short to realize that decades later, he's going to be awarded honorary doctorates by Yale, Harvard, and Oxford. From 1848 to 1852, he learns the newspaper business. This is a picture of him at age 15 when he's in that apprenticeship. He said later that it taught him the value of the economy of words. He learned to do typesetting, and the fewer words, the less work he had. And he also learned that if one word could actually capture a concept, don't monkey it up with additional words. Don't overwrite something. So actually his work as a newspaper apprentice uh, was key in his learning later to be a fine writer. 1853, now that he has a marketable skill of typesetting, he leaves Hannibal and he travels to the East Coast where he takes different jobs in St. Louis, New York City, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Cincinnati. This acquaints him with the East Coast and the East Coast way of thinking. Remember, he's a Missourian, so this is quite a, quite a change in culture for him. In 1857, he wasn't making very much money, and he wanted to find a get-rich-quick scheme. This is part of the residue of the poverty that he has grown up in. So he gets the idea that he's gonna make money in Brazil. So he boards a steamboat going to New Orleans and he hopes to buy passage there uh, to the Amazon where he'll do work and he'll become famous and he'll make a boatload of money. On that trip, the pilot of the steamboat was Horace Bixby. And by the time they reached New Orleans, Twain had talked Bixby into taking him on as a cub pilot to teach him to be a steamboatman. This was the life-changing apprenticeship for him. Two years later, Bixby has succeeded. Twain has his pilot certificate. And before his career was over, he will be on nearly 20 boats and he made over 120 trips in the run between St. Louis and New Orleans. Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, again, are the most well-known of his 
works. But again, I claim that they're just two thirds of one major work, a trilogy. Twain wrote, the most interesting information comes from children, for they tell all they know and then stop. He does this with Huckleberry Finn and with Tom Sawyer and recounts that concept in Life on the Mississippi. He has the juvenile characters of Tom and his buddies and Huck and Jim and their friends tell the truths about what's happening in the country. Ernest Hemingway in 1935 <coughs> said this, all modern American literature comes from one book by Mark Twain, Huckleberry Finn. It's the best book we've had. All American writing comes from that. There was nothing before. There has been nothing as good since. We pick up again with the September 1883 review of Life on the Mississippi in the Atlantic Monthly. This, meaning the portions of the book that we have talked about, was followed by an account of the trip he made down and then back up the Mississippi 21 years from the time when he last sailed upon it in charge of a steamer's course. The material offered by observations on the journey is various beyond enumeration, and much of it is extremely amusing. Hoaxes and exaggerations palmed off by pilots and other natives along the way upon supposedly ignorant strangers. Stories of gamblers and obsolete robbers. Glimpses of character and manners. Descriptions of scenery and place. Statistics of trade, Indian lore, extracts from the comments of foreign travelers, all of these occur interspersed with two or three stories of either humorous or tragic import, or of both together. Some scholars have suggested that these portions of Twain's life on the Mississippi that fall at the end of the book were placed there by the author as padding so he could make his book a little bit longer, kind of add-ons with no thought to them. I disagree. They actually are the strongest reinforcements of two of his central themes in all three of these books, that change and progress are inevitable. There were many influences on Twain's life and therefore on his writing. No doubt the Mississippi River was a major influence. Life on the Mississippi makes that very clear. But there are other influences, and not all of them were positive. First, born out of his childhood in extreme poverty, money held an allure for Twain that others might not have felt. He had a good apprenticeships. He had a good career typesetting with the newspapers. He had a good career with steamboating, but then steamboating kind of went away. He failed as a Western miner. He did well with his writing. He did very well on the lecture circuit. He could deliver his lines beautifully. He won an heiress to be his bride. And his father-in-law set him up in a very fine home with a complete with staff, fully furnished, and an allowance. That's not exactly the way a young man imagines opening his home, establishing his home and his marriage. He made many investments, most of them went sour. He lost at least three fortunes during his lifetime. So money, money was one of the influences which was a negative for him. The second was the anguish of experiencing death of those close to you. He lost some of his seven siblings when he was a child. He lost when he married. He lost his firstborn son and the only child of his that would be a male child when the child was a year and a half old. He lost the death of his first daughter, Susie, death of his wife, 
death of his second daughter, Jean. So death was a thing that pulled him into depression, which you can see in some of his works. A third one was the embarrassment of bankruptcy. The thing that saved the family finances was that his wife, the heiress, was named his preferred creditor so she could save their money. Another thing that influenced him was the aftermath of the Civil War as he experienced it along the East Coast. He lived there, the East Coast, during his latter years, and he was keenly aware of the after the war sentiments, the feelings in that part of the country. People were horrified at the enormous loss of life, the number of widows, the terrible injuries, the number of orphans. It was not a, a happy time. Perhaps at the center of the influences was his ambivalence toward God and the Creator. He was an equal opportunity critic of virtually all organized, established, denominational religions. He had a close friend, the Reverend Twitchell, uh, who had the church known as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, one of the major East Coast churches. Twain would refer to it as the Church of the Holy Speculators. Twitchell never rebuked him on it. And Twain was remembered by many for his attacks on Mary Baker Eddy as she tried to lead her followers to practice Christian science. April 21st, 1910, Mark Twain died. He went out with the comet just like he was born on the day that Halley's Comet came in. He's buried in Elmira, New York, next to his, um, his wife, his late wife. The funeral was at what's known as the Old Brick Presbyterian Church in New York, and the burial plots for him and for his wife are in his wife's family plot in the Woodlawn Cemetery in Elmira. There's a monument that stands next to his grave. It's pictured here. It was commissioned by his only surviving child, Clara, and it measures 12 feet tall, the length of the nautical measure Mark Twain. When Twain died, President William Howard Taft issued this statement. Mark Twain gave pleasure, real intellectual enjoyment to millions, and his works will continue to give such pleasure to millions yet to come. His humor was American, but he was nearly as much appreciated by Englishmen and people of other countries as by his own countrymen. He has made an enduring part of American literature. I hope you'll take the time to read For the Love of the River. And shame on you if you haven't read Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. But lucky you if you haven't, because you might consider reading them in the order I suggest they should be read. And then you'll get a true sense of Mark Twain's love for that river. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. Look forward to seeing you next time. The two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. I get weary and sick of trying, I'm tired of living.